Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen Campus in Hong Kong. Thank you for joining our Director's Pick series, this first sports program held on our Hong Kong campus. Tonight's program is called Power Play, Talent versus Team Owners in Sports. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the UChicago UN campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit the UN campus website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest UN campus programs and information. Or you can also follow us on the UChicago UN campus Hong Kong social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We'll wrap up tonight's program with a poll as we as we uh, always do and more information about upcoming events. So be sure to stay until the very end. The global sports industry is an exploding multi-billion dollar business. Maximum contracts and team salary caps are hitting and exceeding all time records, creating tensions between owners, players, leagues and fans. That said, athletes have more power than ever before through mega shoe deals and social media followers. Tonight, we'll discuss the power dynamics and escalating pay scales in sports, leading to labor disputes and the growing struggle over player empowerment and mobility, while owners try to earn even greater profits and increase the value of their enterprises. So let's start tonight with a brief introduction of our speakers. Professor Robert Simmons is a professor of economics at Lancaster University. His research in sports economics includes earnings of sports stars, pay and performance of players and teams in US and European sports, and economics of sports broadcasting. Dr. Simmons has an international reputation as a sports economist. He's researched into several topics in sports economics, many of which have a labor market focus. He's published pioneering papers on attendance demand in football using a travel cost methodology, on football transfer markets using a sample selection model, and on salary determination in Italian football using a rarely published data set. Professor Simmons is currently working on several topics in sports economics, including a new theoretical model of sports league behavior, economic analysis of sports broadcasting, the labor market for players in the US National Football League, and further analysis of earnings in Italian football. Dr. Simmons is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Sports Economics. He was also recently a co-convener of the ESRC Finance Sports, Arts, and Leisure Economic Study Group. Dr. Ben Shields is a senior lecturer in managerial communication at MIT Sloan School of Management. He studies the multi-billion dollar sports industry to identify broadly transferable management lessons in areas such as leadership, communication, data-driven decision-making, and innovation. He's author and or co-author of three books, Social Media Management, Persuasion in Network Culture, The Sports Strategist, Developing Leaders for a High-Performance Industry, and The Elusive Fan, Reinventing Sports in a Crowded Marketplace. He teaches a number of courses in the graduate program at MIT Sloan, including Communications for Leaders, Social Media Management, Sloan Fellows Seminar on Leadership, and a new course on sports management and analytics that'll be offered in the spring of 2020. Well, we're already past that, so he's probably well into teaching that one. His other sports work at MIT includes co-hosting CounterPoints, the sports analytics podcast from the MIT Sloan Management Review, and teaching in the MIT Sports Entrepreneurship Bootcamp Program, which is offered through MIT's Office of Open Learning. Prior to MIT, Shields served as a director of social media and marketing at ESPN. He oversaw social media strategy for the ESPN brand and collaborated across the enterprise to develop and implement company-wide social strategy. And finally, but not least, Professor Alan Sanderson is the senior instructional professor in economics and the college at the University of Chicago, Kenneth C. Griffin Department of Economics. He's an authority on sports economics issues, 
with research interests in the economics of sports, economic impact analysis, education, and labor markets. Professor Sanderson has received the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching and has the distinction of having taught more students at the University of Chicago than anyone in the history of the university. That's quite an accomplishment. Professor Sanderson has written and contributed to journals on a variety of topics, including the NCAA and college athletics, the case for paying athletes, the economic impact of sports on college and university communities, the economics of sports stadiums hosting big ticket events, and the political economy of Chicago's unsuccessful bid to host the 2016 Olympics. Professor Sanderson's recent publications include the economics of the National Collegiate Athletic Association in the Sage Handbook of Sports Economics, and the Nobel Prize in Economics Turns 50 in the American Economist. Welcome, Professor Sanderson. Let's have you start us off tonight by laying out some historical foundation of sports economics that was started at the University of Chicago and the sports labor market and its economic impact. Thank you, Mark, um, for the introduction. Yeah, strangely enough, for independently given what we're going to talk about uh, in this program, the first journal article ever written in, under the broad category of sports economics was actually written at the University of Chicago by Simon Rottenberg, who's a senior uh, uh, postdoc person at the time. Um, it was written in 1956. We published it here in the journal of uh, political economy. It was entitled The Baseball Players Labor Market. Yeah, it was about baseball, the baseball industry, which is more U.S. than, than anywhere else. Uh, but in the course of that, one of the things, even though it was about largely owner's power and monopsony power in labor market over players, players at that point had no unions, later they become unions and ability to strike and, and so forth. But in that article, he made one statement that has captured a lot of early work on sports economics. And he said, the nature of the sports industry is such that competitors must be of approximately equal size if any are to be successful. More formally, that has come to be known in the topic of competitive balance. Um, Pepsi might like Coke to go out of business or McDonald's, again, using American uh, examples. McDonald's might like Burger King to go out of business, go bankrupt, and gives them more market power. But in fact, in the sports industry, whether it's soccer, football, basketball, baseball, take your pick, we have to have competitors. We have to have other people in the industry. Uh, and that's unique in the, in the sports uh, in the sports business, and in all of these, in, in various ways, and across sports across different countries, um, people have set out in these industries to enact certain kind of things from player drafts, from salary or pay, payroll caps, revenue sharing, other things to make competitors equal, or at least in theory, when I'm going to the game or the match, uh, it turns out that I would like the outcome to be uncertain at the beginning. I may have a favorite team, but I would like the outcome to be uncertain. Either team could, could win. Uh, that becomes a, a, an important part of this. Um, over the years, yes, unions have come into existence. Uh, in sports markets and say other things to try to address the player owner uh, imbalance. And then even within that, there's some, some interesting twists. Uh, 2022 for the United States is 50 years away from 1972, which again, uniquely U.S., we passed a piece of legislation called the Educational Amendments of the Higher Education Act, 
that prohibits sex discrimination in academic institutions. And even though it wasn't started with sports in mind, it really has become what's called Title IX as a way to address the imbalance between males and females and sex discrimination. Uh, and it's, it's uh, a, a, you know, a, a very uh, important part of sports and collegiate sports in the United States. Also, another, I think, interesting issue was a case that went to the Supreme Court, actually started with a mom and pop operation in the state of Illinois. Uh, the National Football League uh, in the United States uh, had a, an agreement with uh, Reebok company to provide shoes and other gear uh, in their industry. And there was this little firm called American Needle that struck a bargain with a few of the teams to provide those, that equipment or that gear. And it went to the court and it turned on one thing in the decision. We have American football that has thir 32 teams the question is, in terms of organization, is that industry one league, the National Football League, or is it in fact 32 separate and independent agencies? Because if it's only one league, then you can't really collude with yourself. Uh, but if it's 32 teams, then collusion becomes perhaps a violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act in the United States. And because the NFL was trying to kick American Needle out and have a one bargain with, um, with Reebok. Uh, but in fact, the court ruled that the National Football League is legally actually 32 different organizations, not one. Uh, again, an, uh, an interesting issue. Um, so there are others that we will uh, we will get to um, at, in, in the course of our, our discussion uh, today. But uh, let me uh, turn uh, the, the time over to uh, to Ben. I think who will talk next. Thanks very much, Alan, for setting the table for this conversation. And thanks, Mark, to the entire University of Chicago Hong Kong team for having me. As Mark mentioned, I come at this topic from a social media angle, given my work as a researcher, teacher, and practitioner in that space. And I thought I would start off with just a few numbers. So this is in terms of Instagram followers. Cristiano Ronaldo. 492 million Instagram followers. His team, well, at least for now, Manchester United, has 61.1 million Instagram followers. Now, of course, Cristiano is at the high end. Let's look at some other examples. Soccer superstar Megan Rapino, 2.2 million Instagram followers. Her team in the National Women's Soccer League, the NWSL here in the United States, has 144,000 Instagram followers. This trend is not just in the professional ranks. High school basketball player Mikey Williams has 3.7 million followers on Instagram. Let's just say in a couple years time, he gets drafted by the Detroit Pistons. Hopefully they'll continue to get better, but let's just say they don't. Right now, the Detroit Pistons have 1.4 million Instagram followers. These are just a few examples. The point that I'm trying to make is as a result of social media, athletes time and time again are now able to build a fan base 
direct to their fans, and in some instances at a level that dwarfs what their teams have been able to build on the same social media platforms. And so I think this is a really interesting shift that we're seeing in the sports industry where athletes now are able to build and in some cases monetize fan relationships directly via social media. This is powerful for a number of reasons. The first is we know that for decades, stars have been important to the sports industry. We're seeing that star power is shining even brighter in my view in the social media era, in part because of what we call parasocial relationships. When I follow an athlete on social media, I'm not just getting that athlete's highlights. I'm getting some sort of behind the scenes content about who this athlete is. And therefore, I feel like I know the athlete, even though I've never even met the athlete. That is very, very powerful. A second reason why this is an important shift in this discussion of tension between players and owners is that now athletes, because they have these large and ever-growing followings on social media, they're essentially their own media companies. And they can monetize their content in really interesting ways. First and foremost, the use case that we're familiar with today is around sponsorships. So the aforementioned Cristiano Ronaldo has sold tens of millions of dollars in sponsored posts that is just going directly into his pocket. There are also additional monetization opportunities that I think are quite interesting. The non-fungible token or NFT craze that we've seen over the last couple of years Certainly, it's in a trough right now, but what was fascinating about that technology and and what I think still could be the promise of it is individual athletes introducing NFTs with branded content and experiences that they monetize directly from their fans. So these are very interesting new dynamics brought in part upon by social media that I do think is changing a bit of the level of tension in the industry. One other quick technology enabled topic that I wanted to make sure we got into the mix because it does change a little bit about how fans connect with sports is the introduction of fantasy sports, which has been around at least in this country, the first fantasy football league was uh, launched in 1969. So fantasy sports have been around for a, a long time, but certainly with the introduction of the internet and widespread adoption of apps, fantasy sports participation has skyrocketed. And what that does is it not only makes you uh, a fan of your traditional team, but it also encourages you to be fans of individual players that you draft and that they play on your fantasy team. So, you know, if you press a fantasy football player or a fantasy basketball player, or a fantasy baseball player, if you press them and if you ask the question, hey, would you rather your team win this game or your fantasy team, which, oh, by the way, you've got players on the opposing team on your fantasy team, would you rather your fantasy team win? Sometimes that's a really tough question for them to answer, and I wouldn't be surprised if some people say, I'd rather have my fantasy team win. So those are two technology-enabled trends that I think are shifting a little bit of the dynamic between owners and players in sports, social media, as well as the growth of fantasy sports. And I just think that adds a little bit more complexity to the issues that we're going to discuss today. So with that, I'll pass it over to... Uh, Robert, and look forward to our conversation going forward. Uh, I'm unmuted. So can I uh, carry on? Uh, Ben made some great points there about technology. Uh, 22 years ago, I was in Stockholm 
And uh, I wanted to know the results, the match results of my uh, own favourite um, soccer team, Manchester City, who we were playing in an important game at the time. Um, the only way I could access this was to buy an international phone card and uh, ring home, uh, not on a cell phone, but ring home to my wife, and my wife would then tell me the score. Uh, that is clearly far away from where we're at now, uh, where not only can I find the score on my uh, mobile phone straight away, uh, I could even see the match uh, through a streaming uh, mechanism. So the technology of viewing sport and learning or learning information about sports has changed uh, radically. And I think that's reflected, especially in European soccer, in the earnings uh, of the players. Because when there is an increase in broadcast rights sale, uh, the increase in rights tends to be transmitted somehow uh, into uh, player salaries. Uh, and that's an important mechanism uh, in uh, European soccer uh, in particular. And of course, that relates to another important point that's different about uh, European soccer. Uh, ordinarily in labor economics, we think that um, if you want to hire a worker, uh, you need to pay them uh, more than their next best alternative um, job or firm. In soccer, players have huge mobility. Uh, they can move between clubs in a given league but they can also move uh, between uh, leagues, uh, especially in Europe, uh, especially through the principle of freedom of movement uh, in the uh, European uh, Union. Uh, so mobility uh, enables players uh, to capture uh, high salaries. Uh, so, for example, Lionel Messi, uh, at the back end of his career, uh, not terribly pleased about the contract offer from Barcelona uh, to renew, uh, moved on to Paris Saint-Germain uh, to sustain a very high salary uh, at that uh, sort of uh, powerful and rich uh, club. So generally speaking, what we have here is a process of what we could think of as assortative matching, that uh, players gravitate to the clubs uh, that are going to reward them uh, most highly. And that process is as much between leagues uh, as uh, between clubs uh, in a given league. So that looks rather different to North America, uh, where especially for rookies, there are substantial restrictions uh, on movement. Uh, players are tied to their um, uh, drafting club if, it's, uh, if they arrive through a drafting mechanism, like in uh, American football uh, or NBA. Um, and it takes a long time to get to free agency when you can field alternative offers. And what I find interesting is that many star players in North America actually stay with their drafted uh, club. Uh, Peyton Manning stayed at um, Indianapolis for many, many years before he finally moved to Denver at the uh, uh, very end of uh, his career. Uh, he was rewarded very highly, of course, uh, uh, by staying at um, Indianapolis, at, at the Colts. So... I think I want to give you a contrast between European soccer uh, and uh, North American sports. Um, there's no salary cap in European uh, soccer, uh, unlike um, NFL and NBA and, uh, and hockey. There are concerns perhaps about um, club solvency, uh, which is why uh, UEFA introduced um, their policy of what's called financial fair play which, by the way, has got nothing to do with competitive balance. Uh, this is simply a matter of keeping the clubs uh, solvent uh, with a concern, rightly or wrongly, uh, from UEFA that European clubs were tending to make losses uh, rather than profits. Um, now, there's an argument about this, whether this really worked. Um, but whether it worked or not, what we do see in the Premier League in particular is a transition uh, where the majority of clubs were making losses uh, 10 years ago, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and now the majority of clubs are uh, at least modestly profitable, although not to the kind of vast extent of uh, you know, teams in the NFL and the NBA uh, in North America. And one sort of further question 
I've got two questions really, uh, which may be related actually. Uh, one question I have about the Premier League in particular is the arrival of North American owners. Uh, so we have the Fenway Sports Group at Liverpool, uh, new owners at Chelsea, uh, where I believe the owner uh, came from Los Angeles uh, Dodgers baseball. Uh, and there's about 10 uh, clubs in the Premier League out of 20 with American ownership and another two, uh, Everton and Leeds, where there's uh, part ownership uh, by uh, no North American uh, people. So why are they doing that, uh, given that uh, the prospect of profits, large profits on the scale of NFL and uh, basketball uh, is, is just not there uh, because any rents get captured by the players? Um, but the second question, which might be a, partly an answer to the first, is the threat of a European Super League in soccer, which is a really interesting kind of dynamic, which actually fits what Ben was describing in a way, because then you would have a closed league of 12 teams, uh, the likes of Real Madrid, Juventus, Bayern Munich, uh, Manchester United, and Manchester United are presently not in the Champions League. Uh, those 12 uh, teams would operate um, as a cartel, uh, as a 12-team league uh, with some <laughs> similarities uh, to uh, the, the North American structures. That's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Right now it's being resisted uh, by UEFA and by the domestic leagues, but can they resist uh, forever is the question that's being asked uh, over here. Uh, I'll leave it with that question uh, as a thought uh, and hand back over. Thank you. Those are great introductions by each of our speakers. Thank you so much. So there, I have so many questions just coming off the back of your presentations. I guess I'll start with Professor Sanderson and just ask, since you seem like you have you know, been at this longer than um, the other professors, did you see when all of this pivoted, when all of this changed? Uh, can you kind of mark a moment in time when we, we, we see, we've seen this explosion in social media and all these other other activities that have enhanced and enriched um, owners and and uh, athletes? Well, um, I'm not sure, um, not enough of a, uh, a scholar or scientist to, to know the date, uh, maybe Ben or Robert Wood, but a, a big factor here, we sort of danced around it, is television, uh, the, the advent of television. If I take a look at a, uh, a national football team doesn't matter because they share the monies equally in the United States. The 32 teams, uh, if I take the Chicago Bears, probably 75% of revenues that the Chicago Bears get every year is television. Okay. Uh, fannies in the seats are far less important uh, than television revenues. And it's... Uh, I don't care how good the stadium is or whatever. There are only probably 20,000 good seats in a stadium. Uh, after that, you're much better off being home watching it on television. Uh, and uh, an 80 inch flat screen television and only paying a dollar for beer instead of 15. Um, and the NFL is aware of that, that, that you're not seeing 90,000 90, seat stadiums anymore in the United States. They're going to be 60,000. Uh, it's just going to be smaller and smaller because it doesn't matter. So, uh, I mean, te television is, um, and, and what one can do with television uh, is, is one thing that's changed things dramatically. The other, even though it kind of gets credited in the United States with a book that uh, Michael Lewis wrote called Moneyball. Uh, which was sub subtitled was something, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game, which is how could a small market team uh, in baseball, the Oakland A's, win against the New York Yankees, who were spending so much more money uh, than they were. And it, it really opens up the notion of analytics. I mean, that, that's become a, a huge issue, of uh, the, the science part of, of these sports of, you know, there's almost nothing that a team doesn't know about every individual player, you know, not only his height and weight and, and athletic proclivities, they know, you know, what he drinks <laughs> and they know who his girlfriend is. They know everything about this, this player that there is to know. And it's really changed dramatically um, I mean, in, in this. Um, I mean, all, I, I think others, 
a sort of a continuum in, in which um, at one end is why does a team win? Because they're really good. And at the other end of the continuum, why do they win? Because they're lucky. And how one changes the balance of luck versus effort. If I think of one sort of sport, chess, uh, in chess, the better player is going to win all the time. Luck is zero. Uh, ability is 100%. At the other end, uh, lotteries. <laughs> lotteries, buy a lottery ticket, uh, it's 100% luck. But across the very, I think it's just fascinating across these sports, uh, how much is luck, how much is, um, how much effort and, and, you know, and, and what it means for outcomes of, of contests. But uh, so I would say bringing the, you know, the statistics, uh, and statistical ability into sports and then television are sort of two big, two big factors that, that have changed a lot over the years. Thanks, Ben. Maybe you can pick up on this concept of television and kind of help us understand. It seems like television is the vehicle for owners to get rich and social media is the vehicle for players to get rich. Am I getting that right? Well, I think that the media rights business, which fuels both television and increasingly the streaming wars, mm -hmm. is a... At a, at a level of revenue that is going to both enrich owners as well as players. So you think about the NBA, the NBA over the next few years is going to renew potentially or bring in new partners for their media rights agreements. And there's lots of industry speculation about how much more the NBA is going to get paid you know, what I'm seeing, and again, this is just uh, estimates, we won't see until everything is written on the bottom line, but about a triple increase in their media rights fees, which means that there could be $60 million, $70 million a year NBA players. And by the way, given the way that those collective bargaining agreements are set up, you know, the NBA is about, and, and my colleagues here will correct me, the NBA is about as close to 50-50 as any other professional league. And so from my standpoint, I think it's fantastic that the players are going to share in this significant revenue increase. That's good for everybody within the ecosystem. So yes, NBA players are going to get paid a lot more, but it's also reflective of at least their fair share of how the game is going to continue to grow. On the flip side, you know, Alan mentioned something really interesting. Another tension point just on the data that you mentioned that I wanted to add in there is, yes, there's now much more information about athletes than ever before. However, what we're going to continue to see in collective bargaining agreements is to the degree to which players own their own data, versus the teams owning their own data. Like a good example of that is medical data. And if a player has had some medical issues, I'm not sure if I'm that player's agent or that athlete themselves that I, I want my next team to know exactly what all of my medical issues are because that could drive down what I could get as a, from, from a contract. So there's going to be some really interesting tensions around personal data from the athlete perspective, even though we have so much more information now, who owns that data? Who can protect that data and securitize that data? It's going to be a fascinating uh, power struggle going forward. Robert, um, where do you see the tension in sports in Europe these days? And how would you co compare and contrast that to what's going on in the U.S.? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, calling it well, calling it tension, I, I'm not sure if that's the right word, to be honest. Um, at the moment, well, I suppose the problem starts if your broadcast rights sales do not increase. If there's a problem with your league, uh, France had this recently, uh, where the um, television deal collapsed. Uh, and actually, Amazon uh, rescued the deal, uh, which itself is an interesting sort of innovation. Um, so... Tensions arise when things uh, are going bad, when there are hard times, uh, when the right sales uh, fall, uh, as in uh, as in France. Uh, the other tension we get is if your team gets to be excluded uh, from the Champions League or gets demoted from the Premier League, 
Um, how do you then adjust your player contracts, which would have been assigned with the expectation of being at a higher level? Uh, now, the obvious thing to do is to make the contract contingent. Uh, but then what that would probably mean is if you're a good player somehow on a demoted team, uh, you're just going to move on very quickly. Uh, why would you stay in the lower tier? Uh, and that leads to a further problem. Uh, going back to Alan's comment about competitive balance, uh, since we have a complex structure of promotion and relegation in soccer, which you don't have in North America, um, the gap between the second tier and the top tier has been growing uh, in terms of uh, revenue opportunities, both for the clubs and for the players. Uh, so how do the teams in the second tier uh, compete successfully? And, and that's where the tension of insolvency comes in, uh, because you get a kind of arms race in the second tier in, in the race to claim the bigger prize of being in the Premier League. Uh, and then some of the teams end up uh, virtually bankrupt. Uh, that's the sort of tension I would go with. Alan, how about you on the American uh, sports scene? Where do you see the tension? Do you see the tension? It seems like it's an ever-increasing pie that everybody's able to benefit from now. Uh, well, it, it, it is. Uh, but um, yeah, some of the... Uh, one of the things, and it will be a topic for one of our uh, programs later on down, down the road, perhaps. Uh, but uh, one of the, the tensions, certainly in the United States, is to what extent are these things really, say, economic impact studies in, in terms of how valuable is a team uh, to a city? Uh, how valuable is hosting a big event, you know, a Super Bowl or the Olympic Games or a World Cup? Uh, more and more, the evidence seems to indicate that uh, all they really do is enrich <laughs> the special interest group that, uh, that puts this on. They don't really benefit the city. And uh, it, uh, that's going to be one tension. I, I think it pops up in the Olympics. Um, there's less interest in hosting the Olympics uh, now than, than there has been before, just few, Cities are realizing, in part because smart-ass economists uh, have spent some time explaining to the city, no, you really didn't make that much money, and for you to bid this amount to do it, you're, you're, you're foolish. Um, and uh, I was involved in 2015. I was hired by the governor of Massachusetts and the mayor of Boston to evaluate Boston's bid for the 2024 Olympics. And we worked through the summer, um, late August on a Friday afternoon, we delivered our report. Boston was the candidate city for the United States for the 2024 games. And uh, we delivered it on Friday afternoon. On Monday morning, Boston withdrew its bid. And we didn't say don't do it. We just said, here are the benefits, here are the costs, here are the risks, here are the actual experience of the last 10 cities that have hosted the Olympic Games. It took them 72 hours to decide they didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, that, that could be quite a dramatic change uh, if, if things move in that direction. And, and quite frankly, uh, terrorism is a, a big part of that. It, it just raises the cost of hosting Olympic Games by $5 billion uh, in, in terms of what you have to do. So it, it, in some ways, I, I think that's, uh, that, that's one of the tensions there. Thanks, uh, Professor Sanderson. Um, ben, um, I was in Chicago during the Michael Jordan years. It was a fantastic time. Those were so uh, pivotal in terms of marketing uh, a, an icon and a shoe. And then we kind of moved through these stages. The internet was still young at that point. Moved through these stages where all of a sudden things are online, things are social media. Now we're actually into new media. Where is it going? I mean, is that the right progression? Did I miss any steps in between? The other question I had, had is, are shoes still important or is it all the other stuff now? Oh, absolutely. Shoes are still important. There is a fascinating culture around sneakers. And it does stem from those Michael Jordan days. There's no doubt about that. I think what we will continue to see is what I've been calling, and again, 
uh, I will cede to my economists uh, on the panel here, but I have been calling this the emergence of the athlete economy, where athletes, because they have the ability to build relationships directly with fans via social media and other Web3 technologies like NFTs, we're going to continue to see athletes building those relationships and monetizing those relationships. And that I think could be a really good thing for athletes, you know, new revenue opportunities. Where I'm focused especially is sort of in, and I hesitate to use this term, but hopefully it'll get the point across, the middle class of athletes, athletes that are not in the top tier you know, Robert was articulating that there's a little bit of a haves and a have nots, right? You know, there's the NFLs, the, there's the premier leagues, there's the formula ones of the world that will continue to see their leagues grow through media rights and sponsorship and all the athletes associated with those leagues, especially at the top end will continue to benefit where I'm interested in how some of these new technologies can unlock new fan building opportunities, as well as new monetization opportunities. I think that's a really exciting area for innovation, not only at the professional level, but I know as we talked uh, when we were preparing for this, also at the college level as well. So that's kind of where I'm focused on how these new technologies can help athletes, maybe in the lower tiers, to continue to build a brand and, and build a business as well. Thanks for that. Um, Mark, Rob, could I add? Could I yes, have one thing? I, I stayed away for it, uh, from it on purpose because it's such an American issue. Um, but if it's in here, and that's uh, the economics of college athletics. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if I go back to Rottenberg's article, he's really talking about the monopsony power of baseball owners before there's any unionization or free agency or whatever. Uh, on... Uh, on June 21st, 2021, the Supreme Court of the United States decided in a nine to nothing vote in favor of Alston versus the NCAA. It was a court case in which it was a continu continuation of other, the O'Bannon case and others in college athletics as to how much freedom do college athletes really have. Um, and how much of the money should go to to college athletics, uh, to athletes as opposed to other parts of the organization. Uh, a point of trivia, in 45 of the 50 states in the United States, who is the highest paid public official in those states? Any guess? You could probably guess. Yeah, I, I, can, I can help you out, the football yeah. coach. Yeah, the football coach at the flagship university is <laughs> by far the highest paid official in Illinois. Uh, at least that's above the table. I'm not sure what happens under the table, but um, uh, it, it's just this redirection of revenues between, uh, you know, in some ways, college athletes in 2020 were kind of like baseball players or others 50 years earlier. There's just no freedom. But now uh, I don't know where... Oh, I really don't know where college athletics in the United States is going to be. And it's a huge industry, but where it's going to be in five years, all I know is it's not going to be what it is today. Uh, just dramatic reshuffling of conferences and other things. It's conceivable the NCAA will cease to exist uh, because it won't be able to survive court challenges where individual conferences, if there are five or six major conferences, eh, that's enough competition to survive uh, a, a court challenge. Uh, but I don't know, but that's the, I, I think in some ways, the one remaining industry that uh, is still far from being settled. Thanks for jumping in there. I'm probably gonna come back to that point. I'm gonna go to Robert. I was fascinated by this um, concept and the idea that uh, American owners are now coming into mm -hmm. um, the, the UK and then the European leagues. Um, tell me about that. Are they are they destined to be um, surprised with how, they, how, how differently things operate there? 
Um, is this just a great opportunity for them to now like take the model that they developed in the States and really drive up valuations on um, teams? Is that going to be possible? You, you were talking earlier about teams, some of them being uh, almost bankrupt. So maybe you could expound on that a bit. Well, first of all, uh, the, the teams that are sort of close to bankruptcy, threatened with bankruptcy, tend not to be in the Premier League. Uh, they're underneath uh, in the lower uh, divisions, largely because they don't have the broadcast rights values for those uh, leagues compared to the Premier League. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, Mark, the... Um, New owners coming into the Premier League must have done due diligence. Uh, I think Todd Bowley from the Los Angeles Dodgers must have realised what he was getting into with uh, with Chelsea. And it's interesting what he did. You know, he, he fired the head coach. He hired a whole set of new players. Uh, this was a, a you know, really strong new broom uh, coming in here. Uh, and the, the immediate objective is to improve the team. But as you've hinted, Mark, uh, with a long term view uh, of in increasing revenues and increasing, yes, I, I agree, increasing valuations uh, of those teams. Uh, so they're looking ahead. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, so the Fenway Sports Group at Liverpool uh, took several years uh, to elevate Liverpool into uh, Champions League winners and uh, Premier League title winners. Uh, this took about seven or eight years to do. Uh, so I think the new owners realise that this is actually a long haul. Uh, but with the developments we're describing uh, today, um, there are some very rich rewards in the long term out of this. It's going to be really interesting to watch that. Now I'm going to jump back over to you, Ben, and kind of um, parlay off of um, you know what uh, Alan was saying earlier. I'm fascinated by the idea that um, college athletes might get paid in the future. And I'm wondering whether, because we're seeing more and more athletes just skip college altogether, go straight into the, you know, whatever league they go into. And um, I'm wondering, you know, is this a good thing? Um, because in America, you know, innovation, you know, youth culture, youth in general, uh, that's rewarded, right? And so the further down we go, the closer we get to the, you know, the younger we get in terms of the athletes that we're following, aren't we uh, also identifying more opportunities to monetize their skills and um, and their background? How, how would you comment on that? Yeah, it's a very tricky set of circumstances. And I'll be the first one to say these three words, which is, I don't know. <laughs> the observation that I can make is, and this has been happening, especially in this country for a couple of decades now, which is youth sports is becoming professionalized at a younger and younger age. So college athletes not only have the opportunity to monetize their name, image, and likeness, but we're also starting to see high school athletes doing the same. And to me, I'm not so sure this professionalization of youth sports is going to be a net positive for society. I just don't know. I think one thing that I would point to and that I'm monitoring is health and wellness issues, not only physically. I mean, you see some of these kids that have played so much sports and they're blowing out their knees by the age of 15. I think that's one thing that I'm monitoring. And the other thing that I'm looking at is the health and wellness of these young athletes and being under the spotlight, working on your highlight reel when you're 12 and sharing that on TikTok. Like there's some really just interesting trends here that we just got to pay attention to and monitor and especially look at what some of the potential unintended consequences are. I don't know what we do about it, but I'm just pointing it out because uh, kids are growing older, younger in all aspects of life and most especially in the sports world. Yeah, definitely. Alan, do you have any other comments on what Ben just said? No, I, I agree. It's just uh, just a lot of uncertainty there. And again, it's unintended consequences or it's, or it's, it's uh, the, the, those kinds of things. Um, you know, if, if, um, again, uh, I, I confess uh, I... I came to Chicago in the same year that Michael Dor Jordan did. And unfortunately, he's gotten a lot more publicity than I have uh, <laughs> and money over time uh, in, in that period. But um, 
uh, I, I don't like watching the NBA as much as I used to, uh, and I, I like to I, I like to watch uh, uh, Stephon Curry shoot ten three point shots a game because he's so darn good. I don't like to see him shoot thirty three point shots. It's boring. Uh, the NBA has become, I think, really boring. Baseball is pretty boring too. Because the analytics say, gee, if you want to win a baseball game, you want the batter to swing for home runs, even if he strikes out half the time. Uh, but it's boring to watch. And, and, and it'll be interesting to see in an analytic or statistical way uh, to what extent, for anywhere from television to anything, does winning games, is that consistent with profit maximizing? Uh, or is it going to turn people off? And the same, I, I think, with you, with these, you know, young kids running around, we, um, and again, I assume at MIT in Chicago that uh, I made the I made the mistake once in an interview of talking about the University of Chicago uh, student uh, athletes uh, were not all that good because they're actually students uh, and they they go to class um, and, and they excel. Uh, but we had this kind of romantic feeling that, gee, this quarterback on, on the Alabama team is, you know, a student at the University of Alabama. He Only in a technical definition is he a registered student. He's not going to class. Uh, he probably hasn't seen the inside of a laboratory ever. So, and I'm not, not making fun. I don't even know who it is. But uh, it, it, it's uh, the professionalism can change a lot. And once we say, no, he's not really a student, he's just our higher gun, and they're playing your higher gun, uh, will interest wane in, in watching college athletics. I, I don't know. Robert, do you see in, um, in Europe, do you see this uh, explosion of uh, fantasy sports, of online gambling? Are those, we, we're seeing a lot of that in the U.S. I'm wondering if you're seeing that in Europe as much. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, fantasy sports is, is fantasy football. Our soccer uh, is, is extremely popular. That's there. Uh, Esports as well. Generally speaking, that's ex that's a growing area. Uh, that, that's really uh, taken off. Um, so yeah, all, all of that. Now, the, I think the gambling <laughs> that's really interesting because, uh, of course, United States has been heavily regulated in terms of betting markets and sports betting. Uh, heavily restricted, and um, I'm seeing those restrictions are gradually, slowly being uh, lifted. Um, I mean, to me, betting is uh, complementary good. Uh, so fans like to gamble on um, game outcomes, not just the result, but you know who scores the first goal and various things. That lots of different markets, uh, some of which are very specialised, and um, that can be beneficial uh, to soccer uh, if the growth of gambling is reflected in higher sponsorships and revenues uh, legally uh, coming back uh, to the leagues and the teams. Of course, where it gets to be a problem is you get, if you get illegal gambling uh, and uh, problems of um, uh, match fixing. Uh, and those, uh, unfortunately, have been documented um, typically at sort of lower divisions and more obscure games, uh, the second division in um, Greece or Bulgaria, that kind of thing. But it exists and it's something that uh, the authorities are trying to monitor. Whether they can fully get hold of it, uh, I'm not sure. One of our audience members has a question about um, longevity of athletes who stay with teams and the economic benefits of an athlete staying with a team for their entire or almost their entire career. Robert, it looks like you might have had some reaction to that question. I'll ask it <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let Alan come in on the North American uh, sort of setting for this, because that's very different, uh, given the rules of free agency and you know how long uh, it takes to get there. Uh, but in soccer, uh, there are, are some examples of players, top players, who've stayed with the same team through their whole career. Uh, there's a guy called Francesco Totti, at, um, who was at uh, Rome, uh, and... He had many counter offers uh, to join other European teams, including you know some in England, uh, and he he just refused each time. Uh, he said, no, I want to stay in Rome. Uh, so you have to think, well, hang on, he's being offered more money to move. Why, why is he staying in Rome? Well, there's an obvious answer to that: that uh, Rome's a rather attract, more attractive place to live than uh, Manchester. 
the climate's better and there's some lovely restaurants, uh, wonderful lifestyle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and that was Totti's um, choice. So he was taking non-pecuniary benefits. Um, he's a club legend at Rome, of course, uh, but um, he enjoyed that uh, and that can be done. Now, he was secure that he would be paid well, regardless of whether he stayed or moved. Uh, but I think we can observe cases like that, where the non-pecuniary um, motives uh, dominate. Alan, do you have any comments on that on the American side? Uh, no, not really. I think it's a... Uh, and I haven't followed the literature. I'm not sure there is literature, and ben, ben may know if there is, but that does the player staying with a team matter in terms of attendance or or other kind of metrics? Uh, Tom Brady moving from New England to Tampa Bay, does that affect attendance in either New England or, or Tampa Bay? Uh, yeah, does continuity matter or Am I willing to pay to see the familiar faces or do I want to pay money to watch my team win? And it matters that they win more than eh, how long have they been here? Now, I, I don't know, but I think it's an, it's an interesting, interesting question. Ben, do you know of any research data that's out there on that? Yeah, I would say those are very interesting research questions, Alan. One thing that I would mention is that the some collective bargaining agreements in some leagues reward players for staying with their teams. So for instance, in the NBA, you're just going to get paid more and you're also going to get a longer contract if you stay with your team versus going to another team. The other interesting dynamic that I am seeing in free agency and in trade speculation is that in some leagues, and I'm thinking specifically of the NBA, that is an enormous fan engagement driver, right? The NBA has three seasons. They have the regular season, they have the postseason, and they have free agency. And I think you can ask any NBA fan, when does free agency start? And they'll tell you July 1st, mm -hmm. because there's just a frenzy around who's going to sign where, what kind of trades are going to happen. And I think the NBA and other leagues have to balance to the research questions. How as important is it for us to keep our players on the same team for their entire career versus the engagement that free agency and trade speculation drives among NBA fans? I, I think it's a really interesting balance and would benefit some, from some more empirical research. And I'm going to stay with you because um, I want to ask you the question, since you sit closer to Brooklyn than um, all of us, yeah. uh, I want to ask you about the summer drama that took place with the Brooklyn Nets mm -hmm. and just the question about, did and because I sit in Asia, did Joe Tsai, did he actually um, win this uh, negotiation with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving over the summer um, where Kevin was willing to and prepared to go to another team, walk away from the contract that he had signed. And then the follow on question to that is, will we see more of that? Or did Joe High putting his foot down so, put an end to it? Well, I think Sai putting his foot down, put an end to it with his team for at least the first half of the season. And that, I think, is a win. It was an unprecedented step, at least pr from what I've seen from a U.S. Uh, you know, U.S. professional league-based owner, uh, I don't think that trade demands are going to go away. I just don't. I think that you know because athletes have their own social media channels and they have a direct line to their fans. I think they could say whatever they want, and you know the reality is in this case, Kevin Durant had a contract and he was going to fulfill that contract based on the fact that the team couldn't find a willing trading partner for them. So I think it was handled for now, but I don't see it changing in many respects, just given the platforms that athletes have to express what their desires are. Thank you for that. Um, just in, in kind of wrapping up here, I was just wondering if any of you had questions for each other. Uh, we've had stimulating discussions in preparing for this uh, webinar. And uh, is there anything you'd like to ask each other? 
Just one for Ben. Uh, since you know, streaming rights uh, are going to be increasingly important, uh, not just in soccer, but generally, uh, how do you think the players will be able to, what's the mechanism for the players to capture uh, extra value out of the streaming rights? Yes, it's a really important question. And I think part of it depends on league governance. So if leagues are sharing revenue with teams and therefore players, then the players are going to get a windfall. So for instance, you know, given the fact that Amazon is now paying a pretty significant amount of money for sports rights, I wouldn't be surprised if Netflix, mm -hmm. as they're moving into an ad supported tier, if Netflix gets in the game with sports rights. So assuming that there's a uh, league governance model that shares revenue, I think the players are going to see a windfall. I think the challenging thing is that uh, for leagues that don't have that type of revenue sharing, it's going to still be, I think the top players are going to get uh, the lion's mm -hmm. share of that extra revenue. And it may mean that the players in the lower tier may not see much of it as all, at all. Mm -hmm. It might be just widening the gap. That would be my hypothesis going in. Interesting. Any other questions for each other? Does anyone have a bold prediction about this topic? You know, the great thing about sports is you can make some bold predictions. So <laughs> any bold predictions about the, uh, the tension between owners and athletes going forward? It can be as large or as small as, as you want. I'm not an expert, but I'm a little concerned about athletes um, wanting to get into the ownership of teams and not having the capacity to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Even if you're LeBron James with a billion dollar net worth, you're, you're not Jeff Bezos with however much his net worth is today. So I'd like to see more athletes get into the ownership structure as lead owners, as Michael Jordan is today. But I'm concerned it's not going to happen because the multi multi billionaires are going to be at the door waiting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in, and, and Robert, I'm sure you'd have a comment on this. I'm interested to see what type of league governance structure um, trends we see in, in sort of traditionally decentralized organized leagues. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Formula One, I think made a good move by centralizing some of its uh, uh, governance and introducing a cost cap for all 10 of the teams so that there is more competitive balance and revenue sharing, basically taking the American governance model and applying it to Formula One. So I'll be interested to see, and you mentioned Super League earlier, which right. is you know, essentially what that's what they're trying to do, at least my read is, mm -hmm. which is to kind of take this American, you know, tried and true professional sports centralized model and bringing it to European soccer. So I'm going to be interested to see, you know, what uh, the Premier League does or what other leagues that have more of a decentralized approach do in order to you know remain solvent and continue to grow. Well, an, an extra point to that um, is that within soccer there are different forms of corporate governance. So in Germany, most of the top division clubs, not all, but most of them are uh, supporter owned in some sense, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a fifty plus one uh, voting rule uh, for sort of any radical changes. Now, the problem with that, of course, is then you don't get the kind of direct foreign investment that you see in the um, uh, English Premier League. So then Bayern Munich complains uh, that some of the teams in England have got a kind of um, uh, an advantage uh, because of the extra resources they can draw on uh, from wealthy owners uh, at Manchester City and uh, at Liverpool and Chelsea and so on, which is sort of ironic, I suppose. So maybe in the future, something's got to give on that front. Yeah, that'll be fascinating. Thank you for that context. This isn't really a question. Somebody uh, on the Q and A box is uh, disappointed we didn't talk about golf and the Saudi 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 money. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I know nothing about golf. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why we didn't discuss it tonight. And maybe that's a separate <laughs> episode. But it's really you know basically buying uh, athletes out of their associations. Right. Interesting, creating new associations, which is another kind of question I had, which is why aren't we seeing, you know, um, in Asia, for example, leagues emerge and become like global leagues? It doesn't seem to be happening. 
from my observation. Yeah, I think what you've really got in the uh, in the in golf and the, the Saudi money versus the PGA or just it, it, I think it'll it, it'll be interesting. It's almost like Coke versus Pepsi or something, and uh, what or United Airlines versus American or something in terms of just two very powerful special interest groups. And uh, I I don't know what's going to happen in terms of antitrust uh, action there, but I suspect some things will be coming along on the antitrust front. Okay, I'm going to ask one last question, um, because I think this field is so interesting. Where we're at in terms of the arc of its continuum is uh, yet to be defined, I think. So uh, since you're each professors, I'd like you to tell the students who are watching tonight and who may be watching this when we release the recording, where are the opportunities uh, in sports? How can people make a career in sports today? And what should they do to get ready? Professor Sanderson, we'll start with you. Oh boy, I have uh, I have no clue. No, serious, I I I don't know. Uh, it, it certainly, um, yeah, it, it's advanced a lot in terms of uh, what we know about the financial side or the the social media side, those, those kinds of things. It's not there's no such thing as amateur athletics anymore. Uh, uh, people again at very early ages are su- superb. Uh, having a you know uh, Ichiro Suzuki uh, started playing baseball with his father at age three. Uh, having a rich, pr- a rich, pushy parent is a real advantage uh, in, in being able to to, to move. I'm just uh, I, I'm just staggered at how good these athletes are anymore. Uh, uh, used to be, uh, and I don't mean it as a you know as a sexist comment or something, but you know back when I was playing basketball, uh, you know women's basketball was quite a bit different from uh, from men's basketball. Boy, these women are really good now. I'm just staggered at just how good they are. Uh, I think I think your a little bit your lack of an ability to respond to that qu- question, Professor, was one of the things in the back of my mind is. Is it still an old boys club or an old women's club in terms of very relationship based in terms of how people get opportunities in sports today? Or is it becoming professionalized in a way that if you're talented and you have the right uh, background experience and education that you can still find a way in? Ben, I'll turn it over to you and see what you have to say. Yeah, for me, any student that is interested in working in the sports industry, I'll boil down my comments to two. One is more strategic, one is more tactical. The first strategic point that I would make is to that very point, Mark, people want to work in sports. There's high demand. And being on the other end of the table, hiring people into the sports industry, I can tell you the biggest mistake that students make is, well, why do you want this job? Because I love sports. Well, guess what? So does everybody else. And I think you've got to be very clear on, yeah, you're passionate about it, but also how your skills are going to contribute positively to the organization that you would be joining. And that argument must be made clearly and compellingly and shows that you're thinking more strategically about the organization, not just, I love sports. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. It's a mindset going into the interview and thinking about how can I take my skills and experiences and articulate how I'm going to contribute and add value to this organization. The second point that I would make to any student that's interested is more tactical And that is to widen your aperture in terms of opportunities and organizations to to interview with and work with in the sports industry. We're not just talking about the sports industry being leagues and teams and media companies. It's so much larger now, right? There's a whole sector of sport technology companies that are working in data analytics or that are working in wearables or that are working in NFTs or that are working in betting. So that's just one example. There are consulting firms that service sports clients. 
there's so many other ways to get involved in this industry beyond just what you would traditionally think of as the leagues, the teams, and the media companies. So be strategic, articulate your value and how you can make a difference, not just because you love sports, and then also widen your aperture in terms of the opportunities that are available. And I think you can make it happen. Great answer. Robert, how about your students? What do you think? Can, can I add to that? Just piggyback on that for a second. When, when sure. students come to sure. me and say, I want to work in the sports industry, uh, I say, yeah, in the sports business, I say, gee, there are two words there, sports and business. Yeah. 95% of it is business, 5% sports. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, uh, don't get into it if you just think it, it'd be fun because I get to go to Wrigley Field every night um, <laughs> and, and watch the games. It's a lot of fun. One of the reasons uh, a question sometimes I'll ask on exams is why do front office jobs in the sports industry pay so poorly? Mm -hmm. It's a concept that came out, Sherwin Rosen at the University of Chicago on compensating differentials, which is jobs that are fun are going to pay less, okay? Uh, and uh, jobs that are dangerous are going to, to pay more. Uh, if, if it's fun, you're not going to make much money at it. Uh, and I'm not talking about the guys on the field. I'm talking about the, the front office. Uh, but in, in the end, the sports business is business, just happens to be in this one industry. But uh, so much else just relates to business. Thanks, Robert. I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I, I was intrigued by Ben's response there. I think European soccer is some way behind those developments that you reported. And there's been a degree of amateurism in uh, some of the conduct uh, of clubs and leagues. Two things uh, strike me. One is the growth of sports analytics, which is now you know, coming into, um, into soccer. Uh, but the problem here isn't collecting the data. That's mundane and probably quite poorly paid. Uh, the problem is what you do with the data when you've got hold of it uh, and actually telling the club uh, executives, the director of football or whatever, uh, what this really means. Uh, and I think there's a, a gap there for personnel uh, to do that interpretation job, uh, given that these top level executives have got limited time and, and can't really be bothered getting deep into this. So that sort of role. And the second one is um, negotiation of player contracts. Uh, Premier League clubs were terrible negotiators uh, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, they would give in to any player agent's demands. Uh, over time, they've got a bit more savvy, uh, possibly through the group <laughs> inclusion of uh, North American owners, I'm not sure. Uh, but they're certainly more professional in uh, contract negotiations. So being a good negotiator, whether it's for the player or for the club, um, is, is an important skill uh, which um, a, a bright student, I think, um, could take on successfully uh, and in turn get rewarded. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Alan and Ben, for your um, knowledge and your insights. I, this has been really fun for me. I enjoy sports um, as an observer. I uh, enjoyed playing them growing up as a young, young man. And uh, just to be able to engage with all you on this conversation has been uh, really rewarding for me. Uh, we have a brief poll on tonight's program um, for the audience on Zoom. If you're watching us live on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your answers in the comments section. And while you complete the survey, let me tell you a little bit more about our upcoming program, which is happening next week, Thursday, November 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Our professor, Philip Bowman of the University of Chicago Music Department will return. He's been with us before, uh, and he'll return and moderate a very special program discussing the evolution and influence of rap music in Taiwan. Maybe I'll ask him about rap and hip hop's uh, influence in sports in Taiwan next week, we'll see. Um, anyway, he'll host Professor Meredith Schweig from Emory University and the author of the book, Renegade Rhymes, and Professor Frederick Lau of the Chinese University of Hong Kong to discuss how Taiwan musicians use rap as a creative outlet to explore and reconcile and preserve their identity and history. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media accounts on our UN campus website. And don't forget to listen to our podcast, the one that we created here in Hong Kong called The Course, where you can listen to many of your favorite professors from the University of Chicago to talk about how they became professors. You can hear that podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening tonight. 
Have a great evening or a great day wherever you may be.